Thank you everybody for coming. It's great to be here and to have the chance to share with you a bit about what I've learned in researching and writing this book um, and also living in China for the last 15 years. And um, as the David said, and as the subtitle of the book suggests, this is really a work about the massive movement of people from the countryside in China to the urban centers. And right now there's about 200 million people at any given time um, in, from the countryside or in the cities, and that number is expected to grow to about 300 million people within the next 20 years. And so that makes it really the fastest and the largest movement of people in human history. And it's really having a dramatic impact on China um, in terms of attitudes and values and standard of living and lifestyles and social dynamics. Everything is changing because of this movement. And also it's creating a bit of a sort of unrest and upheaval. So it's really emerging in China these days as the key issue, that, the key domestic issue that the Chinese government is trying to tackle. And so um, what I wanted to do today was give you first a little bit of an overview of sort of the scale of what's happening and then we can talk more about the issues in the book. So if we look in terms of urbanization, so Western countries generally took about 200 years to make that switch from being primarily uh, urban, uh, rural societies to primarily urban societies. And China is on track to make this transition within about 50 years. And in the 30 years since China has started its opening and reform policies, its urban population has doubled. And in the next 30 years, it's expected to double yet again. So by comparison, Europe currently has 35 cities with more than a million people. And China right now has about 160. But by 2025, it's expected that China will have 221 cities with more than a million people. So that makes Europe look kind of small by comparison. <laughs> And um, among these 221 cities will be 15 super cities, each with about 25 million people. So by comparison, the entire state of Texas has about 25 million people. So that'll be 15 cities in China, each as large as the state of Texas. And by 2030, China's urban population will reach 1 billion people. So urban China will be more populous than the North and South American continents combined. And so obviously this is a very large movement of people and it's happening very quickly. And there's a lot of different factors sort of um, underlying this transition. But uh, the people really at the heart of it are China's rural migrants. Uh, so again, as I said, there's about 200 million migrants right now and there'll be about 300 million within the next 20 years. And I think in the West, people tend to think of China's migrants mostly as factory workers. But in fact, of the 200 million migrants that are out there right now, only about a third of them work in factories. The rest of them are intimately involved in every aspect of building up uh, urban China and driving this, this uh, urbanization. So for example, over the next 20 years, migrants will help to build 5 million new buildings uh, including 50,000 skyscrapers or the equivalent of 10 New York cities. And they'll also help to pay 5 billion square meters of roads. And they, they tend to go into the cities in China and snap up sort of the low paying, um, dirty, dangerous, distasteful jobs that urbanites are not really so interested in. And they also carve out for themselves all sorts of different small-time entrepreneurial niches. So um, some people may haul heavy loads, they may do repair work, uh, sell produce on the street corner. The man at the top here, he's popping popcorn. So there's sort of all sorts of things that people do. And generally, they tend to be very light on their feet and able to sort of quickly remold themselves to meet the changing needs of the Chinese economy. And so you know, I met in the course of the research I did for the book, I met many people who within just the scope of a year or two had sort of continually reinvented themselves time and again. So one woman had gone from selling eggs on the street corner to selling produce to shining shoes to running a small shop. And, and you know, and I looked at that and how quickly she could change directions, I felt amazed sort of by that uh, ability, but she said, you know, this is the way you do things when you don't have a lot of other options. And so as a result of this, urban China really couldn't function without migrant labor. I, I had this idea to do a, a blog post about how much the average urbanite's life depends on migrants. I live in Beijing now, so um, I had the idea I'd just take a picture of each person and write a couple lines about what they were doing in the city. And by the time I left my house in the morning and got to the subway stop, which usually is about a, a 20 minute walk, 
I gave up because it was taking the whole day. There was just so many migrants that my life depends on in the cities that it was, became sort of an overwhelming project. But in addition to that, migrants are really essential to building up China's uh, rural areas as well because the money that migrants send back to the villages in lots of places really is the major portion of local income. And so they're really responsible for raising uh, rural China out of poverty as well. So um, I want to tell you a little bit about how I came to write about this topic. When I went to China in 1997, I wasn't a journalist at that time. I, um, I, so first I worked in education and I had a lot of different opportunities and one of them was I worked on this uh, curriculum for children to learn English and it was used in small towns around Guangdong province and I would go and visit these schools about once a month to sort of track their progress and give some teacher training and in one of the schools the principal invited me to go with her to stay an extra day and go with her to back to her village where her relatives still lived and so having lived in urban China for almost two years at that point and really sometimes you don't see much grass or trees or any nature at all and so I really jumped at the opportunity and um, went back with her. It was a banana farming village in the mountains and it was, we had a great day hiking and doing things like that and at the end of the day we were with her relatives and they asked how did you like our village and I you know I kind of gushed and I said oh it's fantastic I love it here and so they said well if you like it so much why don't you move here and uh, <laughs> I think looking back, you know, I don't think they were probably sincerely inviting me as much as they were making polite small talk. But in my enthusiasm, I said, oh, I would love to. And uh, so that's what I did. So about a month later, I moved to this village. And um, it was really an, a very interesting experience. It was definitely the first time that there had been a foreign person uh, in the village, much less living in the village. And so very quickly, I became the local tourist destination. And <laughs> people from... The, the surrounding villages would walk to this village. In fact, someone came from about 20 kilometers away one time on foot um, to sort of verify, is it really true that there's a foreigner living here? <laughs> and um, this is in the, this is in the uh, south of China where it's very hot. And so the windows are always open, but there's bars. Everyone has bars on the windows. And so um, people would come and stand outside the window of my house with their hands on the bars and sort of <laughs> stare in and watch me and have this ongoing commentary with each other about what they saw the foreigner doing and so it was really a very interesting experience but very wonderful and um, the people especially were you know very um, sincere and very hospitable and this was really I think pivotal for me in terms of helping me to think about China's rapid development from the point of view of the rural people because so much of what we see um, in the media here at least is sort of the boom towns where everything is you know going very well in China um, so this gave me a, a foundation I think for for the book and uh, this is another picture of the village it was called the flower fruit village and uh, from there I moved to Xi'an which is the ancient capital of China and it's most well known in the US I think for being the home to the terracotta soldiers and it's also in western China which has been the um, <coughs> least developed in the poorest part of China and in fact when China started its opening reforms uh, three decades ago, they had this concept basically that they would allow a small part of the population first to become prosperous and that those people then would pull everybody else up to prosperity. And so eastern China, the, the sort of the crescent along the, the seaboard there was chosen to lead everybody else to prosperity. And western China was just sort of ignored largely for several decades and um, languished behind the rest of the country. And so I moved to Xi'an in 1999 and in January of 2000 the, uh, the government launched what's called the Go West policy. And that essentially was uh, designed to help Western China catch up with the rest of the country because the gap between the two had really become unmanageable at that point. And so uh, when the Chinese government decides to do something, sometimes it happens extremely quickly. And so within months of that policy ho opening, money came pouring into the, the, the city of Xi'an, and especially the high-tech zone. There was what's called the high-tech zone, which is where I was living at that time. And so from my window in my apartment in the high-tech zone, at any given time I would look out and there would be 15 to 20 cranes on the horizon putting up new urban developments. Um, but what there also was, what I could also see really basically right behind my apartment complex was this old village called Ganjajai. And um, this is actually the village whose land the high tech zone was built on. So what happens in China is that as the urban areas expand, the local city governments will buy up the neighboring farmland, 
but they don't generally buy up the cluster of village homes. And so the farmers who lose their land in this process, they take whatever money they're paid for their land and they tend to use that to build onto their homes or sometimes they gut their homes basically and start again. And then they rent out their homes room by room to the migrants who come into the new up and coming urban areas looking for work. And so this is extremely common in China. It's uh, so common that there's a term for it, which is city village. And the, these city villages, you'll see them in any, every city in China, basically. And they're really the way that China has sort of avoided the absolute poverty, urban slums like you might see in India or Brazil or other countries. And um, because they provide such a sort of critical, low-cost housing alternative for migrants, they tend to be very densely populated. So this village was um, originally home to about 1,500 farmers. And when I was living there, they estimated there was about 30,000 migrants sandwiched into six blocks. So it's a very high population density. And then, of course, a lot of social problems follow, follow along as well. And um, in 2004, so I lived there from 99 to 2004, and then I went back, I came back to the US for grad school and I did a master's in journalism. And when I graduated, I received a fellowship to work on a book length project. And so I knew that I wanted to write about all the transformation I had experienced in China. So I went back to that same neighborhood where I had lived before. And what I found was that the city village of Ganja Jai was about to be demolished. And everybody that I worked, that I interacted with regularly, you know, the people who I bought vegetables from or who worked in restaurants, the security guards, everybody was very anxious and so upset about this because they lived in this village and there weren't many more of these villages left and they weren't sure once these were gone, how could they support their life in the city anymore. And so that really became the backdrop for the book. Um, essentially, in the book, you'll find eight different profiles of migrants who've come from different places in rural China into Xi'an, and they find work in the high-tech zone. They live in this old city village, and the book really kind of chronicles how successfully, or in some cases unsuccessfully, they're able to integrate into urban life and enjoy the fruits of their labors, and, and um, also how well they're able to accomplish the, the goals that they've set out for themselves. Now, in addition to that, what I try to capture in the book is also the spirit of the people, because I think that a lot of times the sort of storyline that you see in uh, the media about rural people in China or about migrants is that they're downtrodden victims of oppression, that sort of concept. And um, that's not my experience with them, and I don't think that that's really the, the way that most migrants view their own reality. I think that overall they tend to be pretty upbeat given the situation there and they tend to be pretty upbeat and optimistic about their future and they're extremely enterprising. They find lots of ways to solve problems that I would have given up on long ago. And um, in Chinese, as David mentioned, there's this great word which essentially it doesn't translate directly into English, but it essentially means to endure hardship, to persevere and to just sort of keep moving ahead without complaining. And so, for lack of a better word in English, if we translate it directly, it comes out to eating bitterness. And so that's where the title of the book comes from. And that's really, um, I didn't set off with this as a theme in mind in the beginning, but as I talked to different migrants over and over again, they themselves brought this up as being the key to their ability to survive in China, in urban China for so long. And, and really, it emerges in every chapter, all the different ways that people have to um, change and grow and develop and persevere in order to keep a place for themselves in this really rapidly changing society. Um, so I want to give you, I'll, I want to give you a, um, an overview of some of the stories in the book, but first I'm going to answer a few key questions that give you a little bit of background about migrants. So the first one is who are China's rural migrants? And so people tend to think that they're the lowest level of society, but that's generally not the case. Over time, they're increasingly um, more well-educated and increasingly younger. So last year, a full 70% of migrants were under the age of 30, and 65% uh, typically finished middle school. The, the thing, though, in China is that there's only nine years of compulsory education. If you want to get into high school, you have to pass a very uh, competitive entrance exam, and you also have to pay for high school. So in poor rural areas, less than 50% um, of people will go on to high school, so for a lot of people, they end up in the cities as migrants. Um, the next question is, why do people come to the cities? Why are, why are rural people coming to the cities? 
So the obvious answer to this is that there's a large and growing income gap in China. So uh, urban income is about three and a half times higher than rural income. And then also Eastern income is about one and a half times higher than Western income. But to put this in perspective, so I live in Beijing and for a very average two bedroom house, with the ceiling is collapsing in our apartment, but for a very average, it's not a fancy house, it's very average uh, two bedroom apartment, what I pay in rent each month is more than a farmer in Western China will make in an entire year. So that's a really significant driver pushing people to the cities to look for uh, jobs with higher salaries. And related to this is an issue of a lack of land in China. So uh, when China ended collectivized agriculture in the late 70s and early 80s, they had to do something with all of that land that uh, previously was collectivized. So what they essentially did is every local village government divvied up all their farmland and every resident of that village received a plot of land. And this is essentially still what's the, uh, the system that's in place today. So if you're born as a rural resident in China, at birth you receive a plot of land. Um, it's not exactly yours, so you cannot sell it. Uh, if you let the land go fallow, you'll lose it. And when you die, it goes back to the village to be redistributed to the next generation. But other than that, it's essentially yours for life. And so this is really, I, it's hard to um, sort of impress how, how important this piece of land is to these farmers. It's really their main sort of social security and um, they really value this land. The problem comes though that by the time you divvy up all the arable land in China among seven to eight hundred million rural residents, each person only gets about a sixth of an acre of land. So even if you assume a Chinese family of four, that's still 673 times smaller than the average American farm. So when you're talking about plots of land that are so small, farming in China is really not a viable livelihood. It's more of a sustenance insurance plan. It's just a way to make sure that you can keep your family fed. And so anyone who really wants to do more than just keep their family fed, they typically have to send at least one family member to the cities to look for work as, as migrants. And then I want to also look at what are some of the difficulties that migrants face when they arrive in the cities. There's a lot of them, and I'll, so I'll just go over them quickly. But um, first one is working conditions. So they tend to be um, overworked. 70% or 80% will work seven days a week. And um, you know, 9, 10, 12, 15 hour days are very common. Um, also, they tend to be underpaid. And there was a lot of news in China a couple years back that migrant salaries had risen quickly and they are now within about 20 to $30 of a college graduate starting salary. And so when this news came out, what happened is a lot of um, seventh graders, sixth, seventh, eighth graders started dropping out of school because they thought, oh, I can go to the city and make you know, about what a college graduate makes. But of course, what they're not really thinking about is that a college graduate, one, their salary is going to go up pretty steeply over the course of their life. But also, a college graduate is not working seven days a week, 16-hour days, 360 days a year. So if you look hour by hour, call, uh, migrants are still quite underpaid. And then also in terms of living conditions, so these city villages are often built very haphazardly, a lot of um, safety hazards there. And also migrants, they live in very small um, spaces. So 50% of migrants will live in eight square meters or less, which is essentially a bed <laughs> with a walkway around it. So it's very small living space. And then these villages also, because their people are so transient there, they have a lot of social problems and crime. And then there's difficulties in terms of social conditions. So many migrants, they leave their kids back in the village. Uh, their parents are back in the village. Sometimes um, in the book, there's one family where the wife is in one city as a migrant, the husband's in another city as a migrant, and they have two daughters, each with a different relative in a different village. And so this is very common that migrants, their families are, are very split apart. And there's also a stigma uh, among the urban population that migrants and migrants' children are sort of lower quality than um, the urban population. And I think also, you don't hear a lot of people talk about this, but I think psychologically it's also very difficult that you come from uh, a village and you're living in this very new modern city and you're helping to develop it and yet you yourself feel like you don't have any place there and you're not really a part of what's happening. So I think psychologically also there's a lot of difficulties. Um, now the last one I want to talk about is probably the, the biggest and um, hottest topic in China right now in terms of migration, and that has to do with China's hukou system, or its household registration system. 
And um, essentially, this is a system in which um, every person at birth is as ascribed to a location in which they um, belong. And you're labeled as either an urban person or a rural person. So in China, urban and rural are not just adjectives. They're actually legal definitions. And once you are legal, and it's not, I should say, it's not based on where you're born, because then everybody would just go and have their kids in Beijing. But um, it's based on where your parents are registered. So, um, and once you're registered as a rural person, it's very difficult to change that registration to a city registration. The, the only really easy way to do that is to go to college. So if you can get into college, you can change your registration and become a you know, full-fledged urbanite and sort of seamlessly integrate into society. But in rural areas, less than 25% of kids are going to have the opportunity to go to college. So for most people, once you're born as a rural person, that's, that's it for life. You're going to be officially a rural person. And so in the beginning of this system, actually China's had some version of this system on and off for 2,000 years. But the most recent reincarnation was implemented by Mao in the late 50s as a means of preventing people from fleeing the countryside when collectivized agriculture began. And so at that time, you had to have a lot of, if you wanted to leave where you were registered, you needed a lot of permissions. And it was considered illegal to move about, basically, without permission. But today, they don't use the system in that way. So people are free to move back and forth as they want. But what they do use the system for is to allocate benefits. So everybody in China is entitled to um, free education for their children, to subsidize health care. Um, but you're only entitled to those things in the location in which you're registered. So for migrants, when they leave the where they're registered and they come to the cities where they're not registered, they, um, oftentimes their kids are turned away from urban schools. They can't get health care. They can't buy property. They can't get legal protection. So there's a, a, it's really created a, a bit of a two-class system. And in many ways, that although these migrants are not considered illegal, they're treated in many ways similar to illegal immigrants um, would be in other countries. So. This is really emerging as a, as a big problem in China. And that brings me back to the point that migrants and issues related to migration are really um, emerging in China as the key domestic challenge that the government has to face. I think um, it's easy to throw out big numbers when you talk about China. But if you think about 300 million people moving um, within the next 20 years, that's basically like taking the entire population of the US and having every man, woman, and child leave wherever they are, go to a new place, get a new job, find a new place to live. And um, I think if we try to do that, obviously, I think it would probably degenerate into chaos pretty quickly. So if you think about it from that perspective, you can really see the enormity of the challenge that is facing China right now and the potential for things to go wrong at multiple levels. I think probably things going wrong might be the expected norm when you're talking about such fast and, rap and in a wide scale migration. So um, that really makes people like those that I'm writing about in Eating Bitterness critical to China's future. So I want to give you an overview of some of the stories that um, you'll find in the book. It's, the book starts actually with the family of vegetable vendors who uh, never intended to migrate to the city. But um, this is about 12 years ago, well, in the 90s, I should say, in the 90s, this man, he was um, doing construction as a part-time job in his village. And he was in an accident and was hospitalized for more than two years and had to have multiple surgeries and racked up medical bills that would be about 12,000 US dollars. But for a farmer in rural China in the 90s, that was an astronomical amount that he could never really hope to pay back on farming wages. And so his wife left him and their one-year-old daughter in the village with his mother and went to the city to look for work. And so now they're reunited. That was about 12 years uh, before I met them. And they're reunited now in Xi'an. And they work every day from uh, 3 AM to 9 PM. So 18 hour days, uh, seven days a week. The last, uh, basically, they maybe take a day off for the spring festival. And so this has been the last 12 years they've been working like that. And what they told me is they do this really with one goal in mind. And that's that their daughter doesn't have the same sort of tired existence that they do, that she'll have more skills to offer society and something more to do with, with her life. Then there's also a chapter about young girls who 
don't pass the, uh, the high school entrance exam. So right out of middle school at 15, they come to the cities looking for work. And these girls end up working in um, a chain of beauty salons, which is really a new industry emerging in Western China. And this chain of beauty salons is very good at holding up a picture of a very bright future the girls can have if they work hard and find a way to become managers in this company. And they're always kind of saying you can have a house and a car and you can become a permanent urban resident. And so the girls, for their part, they're really eager to accomplish these things. And yet they feel sort of helpless and hopeless because as you know, fairly poorly educated girls coming from the countryside, they don't feel that they ever could really become managers in a company like this. And so they live with this underlying fear that if they don't get their act together and figure, figure things out, they may not have a permanent place in the city. They may end up going back to their villages and being farmers like their parents. And so um, this chapter, this is a very sort of common thing that happens to young people who come to um, cities. So this is a, a, that chapter. Then there's a chapter about um, a family who is actually one of the original families of farmers in the city village of Ganjajai. And they lost their land when the high-tech zone was built. And probably you've followed the news. You've seen there's been a lot of um, protests in China in the last year. I think there was about 100,000 protests last year about farmers who have had their land unfairly grabbed from them, or they've been not well compensated for their land. And so that's a, a serious problem in China. But I've never seen anyone really talking about the other side of the picture, which is actually more common, which is Farmers are paid well for their land. I don't think that probably isn't as catchy of a headline, so you don't see it very often. But um, in all the villages that I've been to, most farmers are sort of eagerly awaiting for the day when the city might expand out to their village because they know that they'll make more money, that they'll get paid more money for their land than they could ever make farming their land. And so it's sort of seen like a you know like a lottery ticket if you can if you have, the city moves out to your village. And so. Um, this family, they, when their farm line was bought from them in the 90s for the, to make way for the high-tech zone, um, at that time in China, an extremely wealthy person was not called a millionaire. They were called a 10,000 heir. So if you had 10,000 renminbi at that time, you were you know, extremely wealthy. And they made at that time 50,000, they got paid 50,000 renminbi for their land. So they were 10,000 heirs five times over. And, um, on top of that, when I met them, by renting out rooms in their home, they made about 10,000 renminbi in income a month. And um, at that time, a, a software programmer in the high-tech zone would make about 3,000. So financially, they're very set. But um, what happens, and this is extremely common in this village, and I've seen this in many city villages, is that now they have, uh, you know, they're financially secure, but they don't have anything to do, and they don't really have a lot of other skills, um, skill sets. So, idleness and addiction really sort of seep in. And so this man, he's been addicted to mahjong for the last 20 years. And uh, he told me it's his full-time occupation. And it's, it's really sad in some ways. And, and in fact, in this village, many people told me that when they lost their land, the farmers now, you know, some people turn to Buddhism. Like everyone was looking for something to occupy their time. So some people turn to Buddhism. Some people turn to gambling. But then they said the most pitiful of us are those who didn't find anything. And we still don't know what to do with our time. So. I think this chapter is pretty important because it shows the other side of the picture in terms of what happens when China's farmers who lose their land to urbanization are paid well. There's a whole new set of social issues that really creep in uh, to these areas. And the book ends with the story of a 32-year-old second grade dropout who uh, came to Xi'an essentially destitute, but within about five years amassed a small empire of convenience stores and health clinics and fitness stores, fitness centers, and um, really he's blown past all the typical obstacles that would be in a migrant's path. But he finds himself more lonely and isolated than he ever was as a poor man, and he really he has this desire to turn his sight away from his own material prosperity, and he wants to become a philanthropist. But he doesn't tell anybody this because he feels like in uh, Chinese society today, nobody could really understand that desire. And they would sort of laugh at him and say, stop being silly, just focus on getting more rich, basically. And so I was really drawn to this story, not just because it's sort of the typical rags to riches story, but I think that it's really emblematic of the direction that modern China is headed. Because when China started its opening and reform policies 30 years ago, people had this uh, underlying concept that 
First, you have to focus on material prosperity. You have to have a strong material foundation, and then you can think about other things. And in fact, many people still have this idea today. So things that weren't sort of directly related to material prosperity were seen as distractions. But today, you know, China's changed a lot in the last 30 years, and there are a lot of people now who are becoming quite wealthy and who are um, you know, reaching those material dreams that they set out for themselves or surpassing them. And so you see in Chinese cities now a real restlessness setting in as people sort of are wondering, you know, what else is there to life beyond just having a strong material foundation. And you see a rise of things that previously everyone thought were distractions like religion or social activism, environmentalism, philanthropy. These things, you know, are, are, are gradually on the rise now in China. And, and so I think that um, well, most migrants aren't going to become as successful as this man. I mean, most urbanites aren't even going to become as successful as this man has become. Right now, the GDP in China is growing so fast that um, the, it's essentially doubling every seven years. So everybody is seeing changes in their, uh, in their lifestyles. Everyone, not evenly, obviously, but everyone is seeing improvements. And so I think that at some point, these migrants who for um, decades have basically been sort of blindly pushing ahead and enduring difficulties, eating bitterness um, without really having many demands or expectations, at some point people are going to stop and sort of reassess that mentality and, and want more out of life and want more out of their labor. And you, you do see this happening already in China, especially among the younger generation, that they're willing to endure difficulties and eat bitterness, but only without it being sort of a, a temporary means to a more comfortable end. And so this is really a challenge to China because its whole development model has sort of relied on the fact that people are willing and able to endure a lot without having a lot of expectations and without complaining. So, so this is a, a challenge to China as it moves forward. And um, so that's where the book ends, and that's where I'd like to end today. So essentially, you know, the, the book obviously is of interest to anybody who's, who's interested in China or urbanization, migration, social transformation, development. But I think over and above that, it's a work of literary nonfiction that um, is really a human story in the end. So you know, the, the term eating bitterness is a Chinese term, but it's obviously not an exclusively Chinese quality. It's a human quality that you see uh, over and over in history as the human spirit sort of rises up and overcomes what seems to be insurmountable, insurmountable obstacles. And in, in this book, every chapter, it has sort of tragedies that people face and yet also a lot of triumph as they overcome the difficulties. So that's where I will end and if anybody has any questions we can open it up for questions. The pollution in Xi'an, well the pollution in Xi'an was so bad when I was there, when I first moved there that um, where I lived in my, in my apartment there was no tall buildings, they were all being built sort of in the distance so I could look out in the distance and for a year and a half I lived there um, not knowing that one day there was a clear blue sky day and suddenly I saw this huge mountain range right out my window that I had no idea existed <laughs> for a year and a half. So the pollution there was very terrible. Um, I think it's still pretty bad. I, you know, I, now I live in Beijing and people who haven't lived in Xi'an think Beijing pollution is terrible but I'm like, it's blue sky at least 50% of the time. So I would, yeah, so I, I haven't been there too often in the last few years but I think it's still pretty. Yeah, that's definitely, in Chinese there's a, a term called um, the after 80s generation. So essentially anybody born after 1980 has only grown up in China's economic good times. And it's actually a derog it's slightly derogatory term that the older generation will use to sort of say, oh, those kids born after 1980, they don't really know how to endure difficulty and they never really face sort of deprivation and starvation and all these things that the older generations have gone through. So. Um, yeah, their, their work ethic is definitely very different and I think it's a big challenge for uh, the companies that employ them because they're not sort of willing to just go through so many difficulties without, um, you know, they, for example, people don't want to migrate as far. They're, they're having more and more difficulties getting people to migrate to the east because um, a lot of migration happens from west to east obviously because of the, the income gap. But so they're, they're definitely, it's causing a lot of um, changes in the way migrants work in, in China. Yeah, the, probably the biggest thing that the government is doing is they're trying to expand that education system. And in fact, they've really spent the last decade trying to rapidly expand the education system. So if you look back in the 1990s, only about 3% of 
of students could get into college, because there just wasn't enough universities at that time. Today, it's about 25% can get into college. Um, still, that's low, but considering you, they went from 4 to 25% in a decade. And also, the same with high schools, that they have um, not enough high schools for so many kids. And so the first thing they're trying to do is have more schools and allow more people to have higher le levels of education so they can do more skilled um, jobs in the future. Um, also, this whole issue of the household registration system, there's been a lot of pressure on China to get rid of that system, do something about that. Um, but it's interesting because in the places where they've had, in cities where they've had pilot programs to get rid of that system, um, two things have happened. So one is that a lot of cities who offered um, urban benefits to the migrant population, they went bankrupt pretty quickly because they just didn't have the capacity to offer you know, benefits to so many more people. But the other thing that's happened is um, in, in Western China, for example, I forgot if it's in Chengdu or in Chongqing, but in Western China, one city had um, this policy that they wanted to allow 10 million migrants to trade in their rural registration for an urban registration so they could uh, become official city residents. Um, but within, in the first year of that program, they only had a few thousand takers. And so, and this actually corresponds with what I saw when I was interviewing people that Many migrants said to me, you know, all, we don't have many skills. We, are, we do physical manual labor. And at some point, our bodies are going to break down. We're going to get old. We're going to get injured, something. And if we trade it in our, because your land is tied with that rural registration. If you give up your rural registration, you give up your land. So if they trade in that rural registration for an urban registration, they said, at some point when my body breaks down, how can I support my life? in the cities. I don't have enough skill uh, you know, to find any other kind of job. So most migrants right now, at least, are not willing to trade in that piece of land for ur you know, official urban status where you get more benefits. So it's, it's a quandary for the government because they have this pressure to get rid of the system, and yet the people who um, you know, everyone's advocating for aren't really interested in, in, in giving up their rural residency right now. Um, well, that's a good question. I mean, I wouldn't call it phenomenal success. I think China is a country with a lot of contradictions. So you see, like, for example, in the last 30 years, 600 million people were raised out of poverty. Um, you see, you know, an emergence of a really wealthy class now. But it, yet, at the same time, there's still people who are living, you know, in very poor situations. So it's kind of a mixed bag, I think, in terms of, of China. But overall, I think, yeah, things have gone pretty smoothly for China. I think partly because people have such a work ethic. Um, you know, the other day I, when I, I said somewhere that uh, China has lifted 600 million people out of poverty and someone said, no, 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 600 million people in China lifted themselves out of poverty. So I think that partly it is, that was a good distinction because partly it is just the hard work ethic that people have that really have helped the country to move forward so quickly. And so it's going to be interesting as this younger generation has a very different sort of mindset and work ethic to see what's going to happen. There have been, in the recent years, there have been um, some small-scale protests that have happened. So uh, I think the main, one of the main ones that people protest about is they want their kids to be able to have education in the cities. Um, you know, socially, the families being split up is not a good policy. And, and even families who bring their kids to the city, they can only bring them there for primary school. Because if you want to take the test to get into high school, you have to go back to the place where you're, regist your household, you're registered and take the test there. So um, yeah, so the, a big thing that people are sort of unhappy about is the, the situation with their children. And also um, in factories, for example, sometimes people don't get paid on time or they don't get paid for months. So p I th I've heard of protests about things like that. But I haven't seen anything sort of large scale happening. I think that is because people, one, they have this this work ethic to just endure, but also I think there's there's a bit of the collective mentality in, in China that still is there that people, you often hear people say, I personally don't like you know, this situation or that situation, but I know that it's good for China, or I know that it's helping China to advance, and so people are sort of willing to put their own personal uh, happiness or satisfaction aside for what they perceive to be the good of the country. Yeah. Um, I think it's probably the local governments who don't feel equipped to offer benefits on such a wide scale. Like, and then some cities, like in Shanghai, 40% of the population is migrant population. So if you're suddenly going to offer them benefits as well, I think the local governments feel like it, they, they don't know how to deal with that or they're not willing to deal with that right now.
Yeah, I think that's true. Like, for example, in that chapter that I write about the landless landlords, the people who became wealthy when their land was bought up, they made the comment that in that city village now, the, like the people who collect the trash or do the recycling or do any of those sort of jobs, none of them are the local people anymore because they said once people have sort of you know, a financial stability, no one's willing to do those jobs anymore. So the people who do those jobs in a city village like that will all also be migrants. And so there's definitely, even among that population, there's the, cla the different classes that emerge. Um, yeah, it, it, I don't know how that is going to play out in the future, but there definitely is this, this group of people who, when their land is bought up, they become extremely wealthy, and a whole bunch of social problems follow that. Well, I should say that first that so that was what happened in the, the factories um, in the south. In my book, I don't write about factory workers because really they are something of a migrant subculture. So if you work in a factory, um, you, you work there, you're given a dormitory on the factory grounds, you eat in the factory cafeterias, they often have movie theaters or bowling alleys. You know, it's, it's a whole universe into itself. A lot of times the factories might have 70,000 employees, so we're talking about a, it's basically a city. So those migrants are really sort of isolated from the larger society. So I um, didn't write about those, so I don't know so much about the conditions in factories. But what I will say, and this isn't a justification for any abuses that happen in those factories, but that um, a lot of the migrants that I wrote about who are self-employed, they still choose to live almost identically to the factory workers. So for example, that family of vegetable vendors, you know, on their own accord, they choose to work 18-hour days and they live in what's essentially a one-car garage with no windows. Um, you know, there's a room for two beds, and when they want to eat, they turn a crate on its side, and it's sort of a makeshift table, and there's no plumbing. Um, they cook in the hallways, that kind of thing. And so originally, as I um, got to know them, coming from my Western perspective, I assumed that they're just destitute, like they're doing this because they have no other options in life. But as I got to know them, it turns out, no. Um, in China, you know, the savings rate is between 30 and 40 percent, but migrants try to be as close to 100 percent as they can. And so it's hard coming from America where the, I think it's a negative savings rate, if I'm not mistaken, <laughs> to kind of wrap your mind around the fact that people will be willing to not just live at their means, but way below their means. So this family, actually, they've been saving money, you know, for years. And, you know, they have enough money to build a, something of a mansion back in the, in the countryside and pay for, you know, their parents as they're getting older and their kids' education and, and all of these things. So I think it's, um, it's important to sort of realize that the migrants aren't seeing their own reality as maybe we are viewing it and hearing about it in the media. So um, I, I think, you know, there are factories where conditions are bad. But from what I understand, in factories where they try to make conditions better, so they cut the overtime, for example, people will quit because they're there exactly, expressly for the purpose of making money. And even if this is a factory with better conditions, if it doesn't give them enough hours so they can make as much money as possible, they'll quit and go to a worse factory with longer hours so they can make more money. So um, yeah, it's, so it's, it's, it's interesting to think about it from their perspective and, and their motivations. Yeah, that's a big concern in China because China actually from the beginning had a lack of arable land considering its size. And um, then as yeah, more and more farmland gets bought up, obviously that's a concern. So the, the central government has tried to put a curb on the local government's ability to take farmland, um, not always with great success because local governments buying up farmland and turning them into urban development, that's sort of the local government's major uh, major income source in lots of areas. But um, in terms of having enough people to do the farming, so the land is an issue, but in terms of the, the actual movement of people, China right now has way too many rural people. Considering now that it's mechanized agriculture, they don't need 700 million people. So they actually, as people leave the villages, it's, it's very good for farming because then fewer people left in the rural areas can have bigger plots of land, make you know, salary that's somewhat more comparable to an urban salary. So. Definitely. So the, the, um, the literacy rate in China, I think in the eight, like if you go back to like the 1950s, it was less than 50 percent. Um, in the 80s, it was about 60 percent, and today it's about 94 percent literacy. So uh, most people can read, of course. And, and if you look at just the young population, it's about 99 percent literacy. Um, so these people in this village, they definitely all could read. They went to middle school, that family, that man who's addicted to mahjong. But I think that 
there's a stereotype, at least in this province of China, that the men are sort of, um, well, okay, the women will say that the men are lazy. And um, the women tend to be more the go-getters. And, and, and so, you know, there, there's also a chapter where, um, in the book where the wife is really wanting to sort of work her way up and become this official urban resident and get a house and all these things. And the husband is kind of like, we're fine, life is good, you know, I can play pool all day and, you know, why, why do we need to work so hard? So uh, there's, some, uh, there's a bit of that that you see, that um, people are just sort of like, I have money now, what do I need to sort of keep working so people don't have maybe higher aspirations for themselves? But they definitely could, and, and a, a few people do, but overall there tends to be sort of this lethargy that sort of sinks in. Okay, well, thank you so much, everybody, for coming. It's been great.